Some of you know the Ura, right? Some of you might think of a loved one. Some of you might think of this, their familiar logo or seal. One of you, at least, remembered something else, and that's their motto. Their motto is in the eagle's beak, and it's hard to see where you're sitting. I'll make it a little clearer. The Marines say Semper Fi, which is short for the Latin Semper Fidelis. That, that Latin motto, Semper Fidelis, means always faithful. I would suggest to you this morning that this would be the motto not only of the U.S. Marine Corps, but of everyone who considers themselves to be a Christian. Everyone who has a faith relationship with Jesus Christ would certainly have this as a motto. Because as his loyal subjects, we would certainly want to be loyal or faithful to Christ our King, to his word, and to the mission that he has given to us. So Christians, Semper Fi. However, if we are going to be always faithful, then we're going to have to adopt another motto. And that is perhaps the second best known motto of our armed forces. And it would be this, that of the United States Coast Guard. Anybody know what that is? A few of you may. Let me enhance that for you. There it is. <coughs> Semper Paratus. That's a motto that means this. It's Latin again. Always prepare. Because you see, if we are always faithful to our Lord, to his word, and to his mission, then we will be always prepared to receive him when he comes. And that's the point Jesus is making in our lesson from Luke chapter 12 this morning. Now, Jesus doesn't use the Latin, semper paratus, or semper fidelis. He doesn't use those. But as I read through this text one more time, I, I want you to see if you can't pick up on those models, those themes in these words. He said, be dressed, ready for service, and keep your lamps burning, like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will dress himself to serve. We'll have them recline at the table and will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the middle of the night or toward daybreak. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Now, I read all the verses together. We're not going to break them apart this morning, because some of these later verses help us understand the earlier verses. So we're going to take them as a unit. Clearly, you get the point from what Jesus has said here, that he wants his servants, his people, to be prepared to welcome him when he comes again. Now he uses a, a, a picture, an illustration in these words that it might be relatively familiar to us, but it's not a part of our culture. It's not something that we, we really live and breathe in, in our country and in our culture. That, that picture that he uses is that of being a servant, or really here the word could also be translated slave. And a servant or a slave is someone who is obligated, either by ownership or by employment, a contract, to do the will of the Lord, what he wants them to do. Now, because we aren't all that familiar with having servants serving on estates, it's not, it's not a common profession among us. Um, it, it would probably be good for us to maybe think of something where we've seen before. And I'm wondering if any of you have seen British television. Maybe you've seen a show like Upstairs, Downstairs, or a, a series like Downton Abbey. It was very popular just a few years ago. If you've seen some of those shows, then 
you have an excellent starting point for what Jesus is talking about in these words. If you watched any of those shows, you recognize, I, I would hope, that it was quite, shall we say, a big deal. It, it was quite an honor if a lord or a lady of an estate would hire you to be a servant, someone who would work on that estate. It was a coveted position. It gave you some status in the community, the local community. It, it was good employment. It had job security. And over time, it allowed for promotion within the house. So they were coveted positions, and people really liked to keep those positions if they could. Wouldn't want to do anything that would jeopardize that employment. Isn't it the same for us who are servants in the household or in the kingdom of our Lord and Savior? Consider what you used to be, brothers and sisters. You used to live in a sin-filled slum. You used to be inundated with that, that slum-like sin, that, that sinful squalor. Your, your souls, your hearts were stained with guilt and sin. But it is he who came to you to rescue you. It is he who came to redeem you from that sinful squalor and from the stain of guilt on your, on your souls by spilling his own blood. It is he who, who gave you robes of righteousness, his robes of righteousness, so that you can wear them, because that's the proper attire for serving in our Lord's house. <clears throat> but it was he who also promised you a mansion. Mansions in heaven where he would live with you and you would live with him forever. He is not a, a kind of brute or tyrant as a Lord, as some would paint him to be. Rather, he is abundantly gracious, kind, and good. We, we sure, certainly do not deserve the honor of being servants in his house. But what a privilege and a joy that we are. So the only proper response for, for thankful people who had been hired on the estate of a lord or a lady oops, was, was that they would um, show that thankfulness in faithful service. So if they, they certainly wouldn't want to jeopardize their position by mm, betraying their lord and later be, lady, betraying see, family secrets, uh, by failing to carry out their responsibilities, or by mistreating others in the household, whether that was members of the family or fellow servants. Again, it's the same for us. See, if you, if you behave that way, you can expect to be sacked, fired, kicked off the estate, banished from the kingdom. So, the only proper response for subjects like us, servants and slaves like ourselves, if we're grateful for the fact that we no longer live in the squalor of sin, in the slums of this world, then that gratefulness is going to show itself in faithfulness. Faithfulness, first of all, to our Lord. Faithfulness to the Lord, however, means being faithful to his word. You cannot separate the two. And being faithful to our Lord and his word means we are also faithful to the mission, the great mission that he has given to us. So it's not up to us to compromise. It's not up to us to, to choose which we shall cherish and that which we shall discard. Jesus says, be faithful to my word. Be faithful and I will give you the crown of life, the victory crown of life. So we're servants, dutiful servants who love our Lord, who appreciate what he has done for us, and who cherish our position and work in his house. And we don't want to do anything that is going to put that position in jeopardy. That could get us fired, sacked, banished. So that if we're committed to, to being faithful 
to our Lord and to his word, then we're going to devote ourselves to reading that word. That means opening the book and reading the words that are there. It means gathering like we are this morning for worship. It means coming together to study that word in little groups, in Bible study. It means also even memorizing certain passages as Jesus has taught us. All of those things are important. But that is how, just like U.S. Marines, we will remain forever faithful. We will make, re maintain that constant state of faithfulness. And then as we do, we will also be doing the other thing Jesus wants us to do. And that's staying prepared. Because semper fidelis, always faithful, leads us to being semper paratus, which is always prepared. Jesus described then what this preparedness looks like. He said this, be dressed, ready for service, and keep your lamps burning. Now, you, you saw in, in one of those pictures the, the servants standing. Servants always had special clothes, uniforms that they had to wear in the house of the Lord or the lady. And Jesus is referring to the similar thing there, be dressed and ready. And of course, keep your lamps burning. Again, cultural references that we're not all that used to. So if Jesus were saying those words to us this morning, what, what might he say? He might say something like this. Have your shoes tied, ready to go. And, and make sure the electric bill has been paid and all the light bulbs have been recently changed so that they, you can have those things turned on when I get home. All these references indicate a certain level of readiness, preparedness. And that's Jesus' point in this whole section. He wants our hearts, our minds, and our lives. Not so concerned about what you're wearing on your body or on your feet or whether you've paid your electric bill so much as he's concerned about the condition of your heart, your mind, and your soul. He wants it in a constant state of faithfulness like the U.S. Marines, but he also wants it in a constant state of preparedness like the U.S. Coast Guard, right? So I had some questions for you. When you're browsing the internet all by your lonesome, would that be a good time for Jesus to pop in on you? Uh, when, when you're partying with your friends, would you be okay with Jesus uh, walking in on the party? When, when you're at home or at work, do you use different language and a tone with others that you wouldn't use? If you know Jesus were standing there listening to you, because he is. Simply put, are you always the same person? Are you always consistent in every aspect of your life? So that by your speech and your behavior, you are demonstrating that you are faithful servants of Christ your Lord and King. I think if we're honest with ourselves, we're going to admit that way too often we've been traitors. We've been traitors to our Lord and Savior. And, and as we've learned earlier in the lesson, for that we deserve to be sacked, fired, banished, forced off the estate. That, if we behave that way toward an earthly lord or a lady, if we behave that way toward an employer, we'd certainly be fired. It's the least we would expect. But thankfully, our Lord Jesus does not treat us according to our sins. He does not deal with us according to our measure of faithfulness or to our level of preparedness. He deals with us so thankfully on the basis of his mercy and his love. His faithfulness toward us. So when we've sinned against Jesus, what do we do? <coughs> the right thing to do is to go to Jesus. Because you see, Jesus' cell phone is always there in his hand. You can call him anytime. He's going to pick up and he wants to talk to you. You talk to Jesus and you confess those sins. You say, Jesus, I've been a traitor. I haven't been faithful. And what is Jesus going to tell you? Because he deals with you according to his faithfulness and his love. Well, through his word through a called servant of the word, through his sacraments, through other servants, he's going to say this, you stand forgiven. 
and standing forgiven before Jesus, your faithfulness is renewed and your preparedness restored. Why will you do that? Why will you engage in that regular conversation with Jesus? I should hope it's because Jesus loves you that much and because you love Jesus. And you are so thankful to Jesus for what he's done for you that, that you want to honor him by remaining faithful and being prepared to welcome him when he returns again in power and great glory at the last day. And make no mistake about it, he is absolutely going to come back. But when that day dawns, did you notice a change in roles that Jesus spoke about in those words we read? Normally, what would we expect? That if the master of the house would come back, it's the servant's time to get busy. To, to, they've been prepared. The house is ready. But now that the Lord or the lady has come back, now that the family's there, there's all sorts of extra work that has to be done. That's not what Jesus says is going to happen. He says when he comes back and we welcome him, the roles are going to be reversed. The king is going to be our servant. He's going to serve us. He's going to elevate and honor us from, from servants or slaves to siblings. From running around the table to reclining at his table. From serving at the table to being served at his table. Now that is a tremendous, well-undeserved honor. And it is something, brothers and sisters, you do not want to miss. So, if you're going to remain faithful, then you will also be prepared. And as Jesus points out to this in this text, it's going to be very good for you if you remain faithful and prepared, ready to receive him when he comes, whether that's late into the night or into the wee hours of the morning, when others would have gone to bed long ago. Not you. Not you. The love of Jesus compels you. And you will be always faithful. And so always prepared. And what does Jesus say that means for us? Just this. Forever blessed. Let's pray, shall we? Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word to us and for the precious message of love and, and, and forgiveness that you give us in that word. We thank you most of all that you reach down to rescue us from the squalor of sin, that you have elevated us to the status of servants in your household. We pray now that through this word, through the study of your word, through the receiving of sacraments, you would keep us always faithful to you. And keep us always faithful so that we may always be prepared to welcome you when you return. Lord Jesus, we look forward to that day when we will be with you forever blessed. Amen.